let's begin. Um, hi, everyone. Um, the summer break is over. We're back. We have an exciting lineup planned over the next uh, month and a half. We will organize three different live events in Munich. They are already listed on our Discord and website, and we'll be making announcements with our LinkedIn later. So I hope to see a lot of people there in person. Uh, for today, I am happy to introduce our guest, uh, Kiru Bikov. Kiru is a PhD student at the Technical University of Berlin, part of the UMI lab, specializing in interpret interpretability and explainable AI, which is also our main topic for today. We'll be discussing his paper, Dora, exploring outlier presentations in deep neural networks. Questions are very, very welcome. So put them in chat. I can read them out loud. And um, thank you to Kiru a lot for taking the time. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, I will share my screen. Um, yes, um, hello, everyone. Um, I would love today to talk about the paper that is called Dora Exploring Outlier Representation and Deep Neural Networks. But generally, um, it will be also about explainability. So I will try to do the gentle introduction to the whole field. Uh, as I, uh, I was introduced, my name is Kirill Bikov. I'm a third year PhD student. Uh, I'm affiliated with TU Berlin, uh, also uh, our lab, Understandable Machine Intelligence Lab, um, also affiliated with that, working there. And my main interests are um, uh, explainable AI, uh, specifically in global explainability, and as well as uh, explainability of uh, probabilistic models, such as, for example, Bayesian uh, neural networks. Um, yeah, so I will start with a general introduction to the whole field. Um, like AI is, of course, everywhere now. And the biggest mystery is that the whole uh, progress of deep learning comes from the ability of uh, deep neural networks to learn powerful representations of the data. However, the, ma the main problem with that is that we don't know what uh, actual what what concepts have been learned and what this representation actually represents. Uh, to start, um, I would love to look up at uh, classical machine learning methods. Uh, there, everything was much more simpler than now. Then, uh, in the old times, we had uh, handcrafted features, supervised data, and uh, intuitive uh, architectures. So, by handcrafted features, uh, I mean uh, the features that have been using the machine learning have been using. Uh, were handcrafted by people. So they were literally uh, hard-coded. So for example, the convolutional filters were hard-coded. However, in the uh, 80s, 90s, with the progress of convolutional neural networks, the, the features start to be uh, uh, learned. So uh, there was a progress from the handcrafted features to the learnable representations. And this was the first step of more or less humans losing control over the uh, models. Since now, uh, we don't exactly know what uh, features have been learned uh, because they learn uh, by itself uh, via the um, optimization procedure. So the next, uh, we had supervised data before. So more or less, we could uh, think of every data point in a data set that someone looked at that and evaluated and labeled this point. However, now with the popularity of the self-supervised learning, we losing control over the data since, for example, the algorithms are trained over, for example, whole internet. We are we don't control uh, the uh, data. Uh, so you probably know with the, um, the progress in uh, natural language processing and etc. In computer vision as well, uh, in a self-supervised learning, uh, we break the dependency on 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 the labeling, therefore allowing to uh, scale our training procedures significantly. However, the problem comes with the fact that once we train on the data sets that we haven't seen before, more or less, uh, we could learn, the machine could learn some concepts that are potentially malicious and undesired, and, and, and undesirable. Uh, but yeah, this is the second part. We again losing control. We don't know uh, actually the data that the models were trained on. And the third thing is more or less a general uh, description that uh, with the progress of deep learning, uh, of course, maybe you've read uh, this essay, the bitter lesson. Uh, of course, uh, we eliminate uh, inductive biases uh, more and more. So I uh, demonstrate this by the progress of um, uh, reinforcement learning, specifically for the uh, DeepMind's Mu0 algorithm. 
that like in 2016, uh, the AlphaGo, the first, uh, uh, the popular reinforcement learning, used knowledge of the human uh, data. It used the domain knowledge over the games and some rules. And with the progress on reinforcement learning, this inductive biases in a form of uh, knowledge that is transferred by humans to the model, the humans kind of define how the model should work. Uh, 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 in, in the progress of deep learning, we are losing that. We don't need uh, to do that anymore because uh, this allows models to learn uh, everything by themselves is this results in a better performing models. So this progress of deep learning is also uh, paired with the uh, elimination of inductive biases that uh, we as humans put to the models. Uh, and, and all these things that I'm bringing is actually uh, the point I would try to make is that the progress of deep learning is uh, always uh, 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 coupled with the problem of interpretability. And, and the more we uh, progress in deep learning, the worse the situation with interpretability happened. So with the classical method, we had control over the representations. We knew the data and the architectures were quite intuitive, for example, convolutional neural networks. Now we have uh, features that are learning uh, by themselves. So like by optimization, we don't know uh, what features are learned. Uh, we haven't seen the full data set. We don't know because it's now um, like trained in a self-supervised manner. And the architecture has become less and less intuitive. For example, in computer vision, this could be demonstrated by uh, popularity of uh, uh, transformer um, uh, models for the computer vision that are less intuitive. And, 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 and research, uh, research demonstrates that they are uh, the decision-making strategies, they differ from, from a convolutional neural networks often. So why do we need uh, explainable AI? Uh, here is an interesting slide. Uh, you, you probably know there is a, uh, it was a deadline last week, actually, uh, for the International Conference of Learning Representations. There is a whole field of uh, uh, representation learning. Uh, but now, once, once we are in an era of deep learning, um, everyone wants to have more robust, better representations learned by the machine. However, the problem is that the semantics of these representations are often opaque. We, we don't actually know what these representations stand for. These are just arbitrary numbers that some layer within your network just gives you. But important part is always to remember that it's, there is some concept, some abstractions that have been learned by the network that stands behind uh, this number. So explainable AI, uh, what we are trying to do, we are trying to uh, understand uh, the, and, and build methods to open up this black box of uh, machine learning. We try to figure out what representations have been learned and to make everything trans transparent so that, for example, we can five, uh, find bad uh, uh, biases and etc. Um, the main goals, uh, there are a lot of goals. Uh, for example, maybe you've heard about the European Union AI Act that now states that uh, machine learning models in an European Union need to be explainable. But uh, beside this, there are a lot of other applications of explainable AI, such as, for example, debugging. Uh, one might want to debug the model to figure out the scope uh, what is the potential scope of the representations? How good, like if your representation detects cats, uh, like how good it can detect cats in um, like uh, an orthodox uh, situation? Like could it actually detect the cats of different color, of different breeds, and et cetera, and et cetera. Uh, learning from the machine, it's also a very interesting area. We'll talk a little bit more about that, is that when you train a model to do some sort of a task, can we actually, by explaining how model does it, can we uh, also learn something from it, some some new decision-making strategies? And of course, the spurious correlations, I will also talk about this more. Uh, this is that uh, models have more or less a simplicity bias. The simplicity bias allows them to learn the most simple strategy of all. And often this uh, comes... Um, into like the, the model learn the so-called shortcuts or it's also called uh, clever hand strategies when um, the network learns the strategy that is not more or less aligned with how humans would solve the task i will show and demonstrate some some cases of that so yeah the spurious correlations these are the correlations that are they are occurring in the data 
by mistake or just by uh, selecting a, a subset of data where this correlation exists, but generally it doesn't represent a, 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 a general pattern. Therefore, once the model is trained on that, it loses the ability to generalize and then can perform bad or even have uh, safety concerns. Uh, so for example, as a, as a more or less classical uh, um, example of the spurious correlation, these are the watermarks. For example, in a, in a data set of a Pascal VOC, a 2007 data set, uh, there was a, and there is a watermark uh, that is shown on images of the horse class. And it was demonstrated uh, in this paper, Unmasking Clever Hans Predictions, that uh, if you train a model on this data, the model can learn uh, this uh, watermark. Um, and when you put it on the other image that doesn't show any horse, uh, your network will think and predict the horse class. And if you delete the watermark from the horse uh, image, then it would be predicted as something else. So your model kind of learns the shortcut that uh, it saw that there is a watermark and associated with specific class. And this is bad because, of course, if you deploy such a model in, in real world, it, it would not perform well. Again, this type of situation happens quite often, and it's a big problem in machine learning. For example, uh, there were several data sets where um, uh, the pneumonia was correlated with a specific um, instruments on the extra image. So like it was uh, even, I, I remember I, I did some projects myself uh, in the COVID uh, times when all uh, images, uh, extra images with people with the COVID uh, they had a specific uh, instruments on top of the people and they could be seen on x-rays while all healthy people do not have this uh, this monitoring devices and therefore this is kind of the spurious feature that needs to be deleted from the image in order to machine learning to to succeed uh, this is visible uh, artifacts there could be less visible artifacts such as some noises coming from a specific machines when the data is collected and therefore later uh, the machine learning method learns this noise uh, and how it attributes and etc and etc so this these are the shortcuts that are not aligned with the human decision making and we want to get rid of them so learning from ai it's very it's it's kind of interesting application of explainable ai several years ago there was this uh, a nature paper about the um, uh, ai guided intuition so how mathematicians can benefit from ai and, and uh, it's a very interesting paper. If you have time, you can check it out. But what's uh, interesting is about that basic idea that uh, people have a mathematical problem. They train a deep neural network to solve it, at least approximately. And then they use a basic explanation method to show the mathematician what features were used uh, by the deep learning model um, and uh, to hint them into the right direction how to solve a, a specific problem. And they demonstrate that they were able uh, by this to, to solve several problems uh, with uh, specific areas. Um, and of course, the last example is the biases. So by explainable AI, we can, have, we can find uh, some concepts like that. We can find concepts that, have, that machine have learned um uh, that are like xenophobic racist and etc and etc so one of the uh, uh, one of the examples uh, i have here in this presentation is uh, for example uh, in open ai clip 50 models so this is a model that was trained on um undisclosed data set but it's basically some subset of internet uh images and and they, uh, the the model have to um uh, learn to give uh, a caption for an image you pass it an image it gives you a caption um, and uh, for example the researchers found out that uh, there are specific neurons individual neurons uh, that are responsible for concepts and for example the neuron that is responsible for the middle east uh, is correlated is also activated by everything related to the terrorism uh, so this is a, a clear example of a bias within the model and there are different examples uh, they provide there as well uh, and this is behavior that uh, uh, we uh, do not want to have in our models so um, now how do we do the explanation so more or less um, 
basically the explainable AI is a huge field and um, one of the important part of explainable AI is so-called post hoc explanation methods. These are explanation methods that are applied after the model have been trained and uh, um, uh, so that explainability do not interfere with, uh, with with the training procedure. So we only explain the result uh, of a training procedure. And, and basically, the methods could be divided into two big groups. One group is the local explanation methods and the global explanation methods. So local explanation methods, they are trying to uh, decode the decision-making strategy of a model um, on a local example. Given a specific data point, they try to answer is uh, how, what, was, what were the main features that influenced the decision of the model. Uh, so basically, this is done by the heat maps or some attribution scores that are attributed to each specific feature of the input, and we can uh, see what uh, features of input have been used uh, uh, for the decision. So in this case, for example, here is demonstrated the Lime uh, method, uh, and uh, 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 given an image on the left, um, we can see the specific regions of the image that are the most important to the model for making the decision. So like in a class of acoustic guitar, we see parts of a guitar. And uh, in a class of Labrador, we see the head of Labrador. These uh, were reported to be the most important features uh, for this class. Um, these are local explanation methods. But unfortunately, one of the main limitations of them is that it's hard to scale uh, to explain generally the model. And uh, uh, there was a nice paper about local explanation methods that often they are ineffective of detecting unknown uh, uh, spurious correlations. So uh, when you do not know what can go wrong, it's hard to find it using a, a, a local explanation methods. So global explanation methods are uh, different from local in, in, in the scope of how they try to interpret the, the decision-making. So global explanation methods try to uh, explain the decision-making in general across the population, across the data set. And often uh, they are trying to do that by um, explaining how individual parts of the model, uh, what do they do, what the job is within the computational process and et cetera. So here we are going to talk about them. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the neural representation. And by neural representation, I basically mean any uh, scalar function within a model. So for example, you can consider the output of a specific neuron after the computational process from the input to the output of the specific neuron as one uh, neural representation. And uh, here on the right, you can see a schematic visualization of what it actually is. So every sub-function within a model, you can consider it to be a neural representation. Um, and basically, the global explanation methods, they try to, they say uh, oversimplification, but generally they try to figure out what concept have been learned within the model and how this concept are uh, organized within the circuits. So how do the information flows between layers and how the decision is made generally. Uh, so trying to uncover, like taking this black box and figuring out what each individual neuron is actually doing there. So there are different methods how to actually explain the function of uh, each individual neurons. Here I'm presenting the method called compositional explanation of neurons, but there are others. And uh, basically what this methods aim for is to, um, uh, given a neuron, they try to figure out the textual description of uh, how and what this uh, neuron is doing, what it is detecting for. So here on this visualization, giving a neuron uh, 483 on the left, uh, the resulting explanation for this neuron is that it detects water or river and not blue color. So uh, there are different options how to do that. This is just one example. But basically, the idea is to map the function, the neural representation with the meaning, what it is actually doing within the model. So what concept it have been had, had learned. Here, I'm starting talking about exactly our paper, uh, uh, Dora. Um, so within this paper, we were aiming to figure out how we can find some undesired, unnormal concepts within deep neural networks. 
uh, without actually uh, like uh, humanly annotating and looking over all possible neurons, all possible concepts. So one of also popular uh, way how to characterize what neuron is doing is by uh, looking at the most activating data points. So the data points that um, triggers the highest amount of activation. This is the method that's been long time used in, in neuroscience to determine the uh, functional and purpose of uh, brain regions within, within animals and humans. So the basic idea is that we take a data set with the concepts and we put it through the network and we collect the activations and then we figure out what actually input uh, triggers the maximum activation. Here uh, you can see the distribution of activation across the ImageNet data set for the one specific neuron. This is neuron, the output neuron of a ResNet 18 uh, convolutional neural network, and this neuron is detecting a Siberian Husky. And you can see with the several images plotted here that a different, uh, uh, like you can see how different images activate the specific representation, and of course the maximum activation, the most uh, right images are images over huskies, over several huskies. Uh, you can also see that snow activates this representation a little bit. Then you, there go some general animals and cats, and then there is something else completely. Uh, so yeah, by, by looking on the most this images or data points that activate the neurons the most, we can figure out what this neuron is actually doing within the model. Uh, in our paper, we introduced something that we call representational analysis. It's a global framework for understanding the model's decision-making process. And this uh, framework is based on the idea of analyzing the interrelationships between the neural representations or just neurons within models. So uh, basically neurons within even the same layers, they often correlate uh, with each other. And we want to understand this correlation and why they are there. And generally what we want to build is that we want to facilitate the visualization of the neurons of the concept that have been learned within one layer. Uh, and we want to understand how they are correlated between each other, why they are correlated between each other. And the finally, what we are, uh, were interested in, we were interested in what are actually outliers in this space. So given a, a, a layer, uh, given the functions that determines the similarity between learned concepts of the neurons, what are the concepts that detect unique, uh, un, like, like concepts that are not correlating with everything else? So here is a, a, a quick visualization of the idea. So we are having on the left, we are having a model that have learned some concept within a hidden layer. Um, this, the DORA approach and the whole representation analysis approach allows us to uh, determine a, a similarity between concepts that have been learned within this neurons. And you can see it as a distance matrix that cat neurons and lion neurons more or less are similar to each other. The tree neurons are the same. And then there is at least hypothetically, we hypothesize that if there are something undesired, malicious, and completely unnatural to the task, because often these spurious correlations are unnatural to the task. As I demonstrated, the watermark is completely unnatural to the task of detecting horses. So therefore, we hypothesize that this representation would be unique. They would detect something that no other representations are detecting, and therefore, they could be outliers in this space. So here on this figure, on the last figure, after analyzing the distance metrics, we can cluster the representation and figure out what are the outliers. And I will later show what's in practice this outliers in code. So how do we do that? So in order to build, uh, to estimate the similarity between uh, concepts that have been learned in the specific neurons, so we are talking about given a layer, for example, in ResNet 18, we, we select a specific layer, um, uh, for example, the a layer before the output, it contains 512 uh, scalar neurons. So we want to determine the distance, the similarity between these neurons, and the similarity should be um, based on how similar the concepts that these neurons and code how similar are the concepts. So in, in our work, we introduced something called extreme activation distance, and it is based on analyzing the how activated 
two neurons are on each other uh, um, uh, activation maximization signals. So basically on the left, you can see the distribution. Uh, uh, here, uh, the points represent images within the ImageNet data set. And on the y-axis, uh, this is F, uh, um, I, oh, sorry, FJ on the y-axis. Uh, this is an output of uh, a neuron output, ResNet output neuron detecting zebras. And uh, on the uh, x-axis, we have an output of a neuron that detecting lionfish. So lionfish is a fish that uh, you can see, like um, I will later show. Uh, this you can see it on orange on the right. So uh, on the, but yeah, look, let's look on the left figure. The left figure demonstrates exactly mutual activations of this uh, uh, two neurons. And with the blue uh, dots, uh, these blue dots represent the most activating images for the FJ. So for the zebra representation, you can see them on the right. And with the orange points, you can see the uh, images that maximally activate the lionfish representation. And you can also see them on the right uh, in orange color. And what we can see from that by drawing these two vectors that we called representation activation vectors, R, uh, they are pointing to the centroid, so the average activation across this cluster. So what we can see from this left figure is actually that these two vectors are uh, correlated. So they, they have a, uh, the cosine, the angle between these vectors, they are not orthogonal to each other. What this practically means, it means that actually the most activating images for the zebra representation activate lionfish representation. And the most activating images for the lionfish actually significantly activate the zebra. And basically the idea of the extreme activation distance is to measure the cosine similarity between these two vectors. Uh, one might ask, but why exactly lionfish images activate zebra and why zebra activate lionfish? Well, the basic idea is exactly demonstrated by the most activating images. We can observe that this color stripe uh, uh, pattern between zebras and lionfish are shared. Therefore, when you put a zebra uh, through the network, when you inference the zebra image, it still activates the lionfish. If you put a lionfish like this a pattern, a uh, black white stripe pattern fish, if you put it through the network, it activates zebras. And we measure the similarity between these two neurons, so between functions, based on the angle of this uh, so-called representation activation vectors. So to demonstrate how it actually works uh, in a different scenarios here, uh, on the x-axis, we took one specific representation. It always, uh, like the, in all four plots, it is activation of a husky representation. But on the y-axis, we demonstrate here four different representation that are detecting uh, diff four different classes. And they, these classes are from left to right into decreasing visual similarity between Husky, uh, between Husky and the class. So on the most left figure, we can observe that on the y-axis, it is a Malamute representation. So Malamute, if you don't know, it's a dog that really looks like a Husky. And what we can see from this figure, from the most left figure, is that both representation activation vectors are almost like the almost are correlated, they don't have any angle between the representation activation vectors. That again me means that if you put uh, a Malamute image through the network, the Husky uh, neuron will be very, very activated. And vice versa, if you put a Husky through the network, the Malamute representation will be activated. Then we have uh, the second left image, which is Samoyed dog. It's still a dog, but it looks less like a Husky. And here you can observe that this uh, uh, vector is becoming less uh, uh, aligned. And so they are still activating each other. These two representations, the most activating images still activate each other, but already less. Then we can observe the, the uh, third figure with a tiger. Tiger is still an animal. It shares some low level features like uh, uh, ears and, and fur, but still already is a different breed and etc. Cetera, et cetera. We still see some, like it's not completely uh, uh, orthogonal, but already not that much. And then on the most right figure, we took a specific class. This is an aircraft carrier. It's completely look 
looks uh, visually different from the Husky. And we can observe that these two vectors are completely orthogonal, more or less. Meaning that actually, if you put an aircraft carrier image to the network, the Husky neuron would not be active. It would be just round zero. So within this figure, it kind of demonstrates the idea of this extreme activation distance that we, we are proposing. Uh, uh, that is measures the similarity between what neurons have learned based on the angle uh, of uh, representation activation vectors. Um, so the DORA actually stands for the data agnostic representation analysis. And as I demonstrated to you right now, this was all based on the uh, data aware. So these points on all of the graphs, these were images from ImageNet. But uh, activation maximization methods that are trying to figure out what the neuron has been learning by finding uh, image from some kind of data set that maximally activates this representation. One way to do that is actually to synthesize the image by yourself. So uh, this is also a very big area of um, uh, explainability where people are coming up with different methods how to actually synthesize the image that maximally activates the neuron. One of the most uh, popular approaches called feature visualization. Basically, if you have an access to the model, to the specific neuron, you can uh, optimize the input. So you optimize the image itself to maximize the activation of a neuron. There you apply several specific categorizations in order to make image more visually uh, uh, pleasing. Uh, but it actually quite uh, often works. Uh, and and these are like this resulting uh, synthetic activation maximization signals as we refer to them. Uh, they are quite in interpretable. So, for example, here on this visualization, you can observe that on the left, these are most activating images from ImageNet for the one specific neuron. Uh, as you probably can guess, this neuron detects like lizards and frogs. And then uh, on the right, you can see the synthetically generated uh, activation maximization signal. And uh, genuinely, people can guess that this is something related to the lizards or, or frogs. This is a neuron exactly with, uh, like I mentioned, the CLIP uh, Resident 50 network. So data agnostic representation analysis, DORA, stands for when we are using not the real images from the specific data set, but the synthetic one, allowing us to uh, completely perform our uh, similarity analysis without any data. So yeah, as I mentioned, this is a, a slide from the feature visualization paper. Um, this is how um, like uh, related the, the synthetic uh, approaches that doesn't use the data with the uh, um, uh, data aware approach that is demonstrated on the on the first row, and the synthetic approach is demonstrated on the last row. You can see that there are like similarities. Um, just a little bit side note that of course um, there are several papers that claim that, of course, that the real images are more interpretable. Uh, and this is true. Uh, however, the main problem with the real images is that you need to have uh, images for every concept. So a specific problem why it could not be applied everywhere is that, for example, this clip model that we talked about, it was trained on undisclosed data set, and uh, it was basically trained on the whole internet. And uh, ImageNet just does not have uh, the concept that the, the, this network has learned. So given an example, it, we demonstrated this in our paper, there is a specific neuron that detects Star Wars um, uh, images and, and everything related to Star Wars. But from if you try to explain it with ImageNet, ImageNet just does not have uh, images with, uh, with the lightsabers and et cetera, and et cetera. Therefore, you are giving wrong explanation. You can uh, be mistake. You, you can make mistakes on, 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 on what this neuron is specifically doing. So uh, just not going too deep, uh, in, in our DORA paper, we propose this extreme activation distance that measures the similarity of concepts that have been learned by neurons. And we evaluate it in a different benchmarks. We also demonstrate that um, when we know what concepts have been learned between two neurons, the extreme activation distance is aligned with how humans evaluate the distance between concepts. So uh, this is more or less in the line of the fact that visual similarity of, of concepts often means semantic similarity. So basically what it means, it means that if we know that there is one neuron detecting, uh, for example, cats, and another neuron is detecting lions, the distance that humans attribute between these two classes 
is more or less correlated with how extreme activation distance across different models evaluates the distance um, between neurons neurons that detect cats and neurons that detect um, uh, lions. So we establish the distance between neural representation. What we can do with that? So one application is that we can visualize uh, uh, each individual layer uh, with so-called representation atlas. After computing the distance matrix between neurons of one layer, we can visualize them in a two-dimensional uh, 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 in a two-dimensional uh, plane to understand what type of concepts have been learned. So here is a more of a toy example, but just to demonstrate how it works. Uh, here we have the uh, on the right the visualization, the UMAP visualization of the output. 1,000 output uh, uh, classes of uh, ImageNet models. So basically, I don't know, you probably know what classes they are, but basically there are like 50 more, like uh, it's, it's a crude estimation, but more or less half of the classes are something related to animals and other half is something related to non-living creatures. And here you can visualize, like here, uh, we can observe how the clusters emerge. So for example, all birds, the neurons, they are um, in a one specific cluster uh, mammals and dogs, they are, like you can see, is in, in another cluster, and all uh, unliving neurons, so the neurons are detecting all unliving uh, uh, concepts are uh, situated um, on, on, on the uh, upper left uh, cluster, therefore demonstrating that you can visualize the space and use it actually as an atlas, uh, looking at the neurons and uh, with using this extreme activation distance, you can know that the the neighbors within this atlas of uh, one specific neurons that you are interested in are doing more or less the same thing or something uh, similar. Uh, yes, yeah, so for example, this is a practical uh, example of representation atlas. Uh, so we took a clip uh, ResNet 50 network and uh, we took the last layer of this network. Uh, this uh, layer has 2,000 2, neurons. So you can put an image and an image is encoded in um, in, in a vector of 2048 values. And the question is what actually every value means. So here you can see on the center, this representation atlas, every dot here means actually function. So it's a neuron. And here we can visualize, I visualize several clusters of neurons to demonstrate how it works. So for example, on the most upper uh, right corner, you can see a small cluster. It's related to money. So if there is a neuron one, 1,731 and, 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 and another one, 1,376. Uh, these two neurons, like one of them is detecting just visual. Uh, so it's active when, when there is just money in the image or like something like looks like a money. And then uh, you can see that the neuron next to it is actually related to some images of, uh, you know, charts and, and uh, some things that you can see on a, a money exchange, for example. Um, then nearby, it's actually quite interesting because the uh, um, uh, neuron nearby is related to drugs, potentially because, yeah, usually some drugs can appear on images with, uh, with uh, money. For example, like on the most uh, down left, there is a reptile cluster. So there is a whole cluster of a lot of representations that detect something are related to reptiles. We also found a, a cluster of neurons that are detecting like explicit or pornographical um, uh, content. Um, also, some uh, it was uh, it was already reported, but uh, we found some clusters of uh, geographically specific representations. So, Asia geographical representations. Uh, there is also representations kind of uh, for the Middle East. Uh, and other countries as well. So it, it's just interesting to poke around this representation atlas and figure out what's actually like, what's this cluster, what this cluster are doing, and et cetera, et cetera. This gives you the overview of what potential concepts have been done. Um, but this uh, this is just uh, an interesting, one, one interesting application. But what we were interested in is that once we establish the distance measure that is aligned with the human perception of how concepts are, uh, uh, um, we, we were interested in what's actually, like, what are the outliers within this distance? So uh, by outliers, you can consider some neurons that detecting the concept that is unlike everything else. So this could be just something unique concept, so it doesn't have to be, but we were kind of hypothesizing that if it's a unique concept, this could be something that you don't want, 
with one specific reason, because often the spurious correlations that we talked about are uh, something that is um, unnatural to the task. So as I mentioned, the watermarks are unnatural to the visual task, because this is like a text and a specific text, and they're like, doesn't look like a horse. And uh, we will have put, uh, for example, like with a lot of um, extra images, when like the idea is to like look at the lungs, then it's quite unnormal to have some kind of like other representations, uh, like for some uh, physical um, uh, non-living uh, instruments. So we were interested in what actually the outliers in this distance are. Uh, and uh, we were thinking about that we can detect some undesired concepts. And actually we were. So uh, here I'm demonstrating the ResNet 18 final layer before output, the average pooling layer. And by analyzing its representation uh, space, we were able to find a, a one neuron that was reported as, as an outlier by uh, the local outlier factor algorithm and by others as well. Um, and it was demonstrated as an outlier. And when we looked on the uh, feature visualizations that you can see on the center of the screen, for one a neuron 154, we could observe that it uh, has a, a, a specific uh, a Chinese logo, logo, um, logogram pattern, uh, so the Chinese text pattern, and uh, we tested that and we figure out that exactly this neuron uh, on the right figure you can see uh, the AU rock, uh, 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 just rock uh, 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 curves on the binary classification between images with uh, a Chinese text present and without Chinese text present. So this neuron 154 uh, is um, uh, detecting the Chinese watermarks. It was reported as an outlier. And uh, just to demonstrate here, the most activating natural images for this neuron are images with uh, exactly uh, the watermark. So uh, what's also interesting is that once you look at the representational atlas, you can check the neighbors of this neuron 154. They were not reported by the outlier with a specific percent. So like when you do the outlier detection, you need to specify a, a level at which you are going to, like how many outliers you want to find. Uh, and you, if you increase the, the, this threshold, you can find them as well. But basically when you look on the representation atlas, you can find the neighbors. And if you look closely, they also exhibit a little bit of such a behavior. And here on the right figure, you can see that the green line is corresponding to the neuron 154. It gives you the AUC of 0 0.94 on the binary classification, which is really great. And uh, other neurons, they also exhibit quite significant non-random ability to distinguish images with watermarks from images without the watermark. So this is only one example that I am showing you here, but um, in the paper, we demonstrate this across several networks. Um, also, as an outlier, um, uh, often uh, reported neurons that detect uh, Latin text uh, also present in the trained uh, 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 ImageNet networks. Again, I need to say why it's actually, um, this is a big problem in ImageNet networks because um, ImageNet, like for example, one specific class is, is, uh, is, a, is a class Carton has the biggest amount of uh, uh, watermarks there. And um, by uh, there was one paper from Meta that stated that if you add a random text uh, in Chinese to all ImageNet validation data set for several networks, accuracy drops 20%. So it's a quite a problem because uh, this Chinese text is attributed only to the specific classes. And uh, this is a generalization error that networks are uh, having. Image that trained ones. And again, also what we show in, in our work is that if you, and these image net networks are quite popular for fine tuning stuff on top of them, as well as the clip model, this behavior still persists and you can have it even if uh, after you fine tune the model, it, it, it doesn't go away. We demonstrate in our work that this type of uh, outliers, uh, specifically Chinese and Latin text, exhibit in, in several image net networks. And for the clip model that I demonstrated, the outliers is basically the biggest outlier is just the neurons that detects white uh, background, just something that is quite unnatural because all other neurons are detecting something high level. This neuron is just detecting white uh, uh, background because like, like everything white should be there. So also including, uh, I want to include a small uh, one, one other paper that we did. It's also in line of, of, of what I just demonstrated. It's called the finding spurious correlations with the function semantic contrast analysis. 
I'm just going to mention it briefly, but the idea is quite simple. So once I described the extreme activation distance in our Dora paper, what we want to do now is we want to figure out, okay, but like we now have the distance when we know uh, what, uh, like we know the neurons and we know the concept behind this neurons, usually this corresponding to the output uh, layer of, of train networks, we know which neuron correspond to which class. So how different is uh, the distance that we get from uh, from the network itself, how the neurons are correlated, from the way how humans actually attribute distance between these classes. So here, basic idea of what we call the function semantic contrast analysis, here on the figure, on the left part of the figure, given a network that was trained on, for example, ImageNet, we can build, as I demonstrated, this extreme activation distance between neurons that detect concepts, and, and we know what concepts they are detecting, so like output layer. And uh, this only works for the layers where we know what concepts have been learned. And then on the right figure, we can have a distance that is based on some um, expert distance, or for this case, we choose a semantic distances extracted from the um, um, word databases. Uh, they correspond to how close the semantic meaning of the objects are, so like how humans actually interpret uh, 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 how close uh, the classes are to each other. And the idea of functional semantic uh, contrast analysis is basically analyze how similar networks and humans think in terms of the concepts. And uh, just like uh, this and a lot of text, but basic idea of that is that we want to specifically look where there is a contrast, so where they disagree. When we mostly interested in, in this figure three on the right is the when uh, the uh, uh, two neurons are very functionally similar, but meaning of the concept is very dissimilar. We are we're interested in this, this specific quadrant, and why we were again interested in when the neuron when, when the neural network thinks its two classes are visually similar while they are semantically dissimilar, and we will demonstrate further how it allows us to find the spurious correlations again. So, for example, one of the like this, uh, our method pro provides us a benchmark. So, for each pair, we can assign a score how unnatural this is. And on, between top unnatural pairs, for example, there is a pair that uh, in the dense, like we did it for several networks, but in this case, this is a dense net. Uh, there is a class Coho, which is a sh uh, which is a, a fish. Uh, this is uh, literally a fish. And then there is a class Real, which is a like a thing on on a fishing rod. And visually, these two classes are not similar. Fish does not look like a like a like a fishing rod. But of course, you might think that they are correlated because often, like fish, are visually on images with a with a fishing rod. But in this case, it's actually much more interesting because from the left figure, again, this is just our plot of uh, all images within the image net and the representation activation vectors. And by looking on the most like this orange and blue points, we can observe that actually the only common feature between these images are humans. So this figure actually, and with a small analysis, demonstrates that there is exists a spurious correlation between class Coho, which is a, again fish, and the real, which is a fishing rod, through a human. And to demonstrate this completely on the complete right part of this figure, we take a human without fish, without the fishing rod, and you put it through the network from the dense net, and then it is predicted to be a coho fish. There is no fish on the image. So this uh, demonstrates the ability of the function semantic contrast analysis to automatically find spurious correlations. Um, another spurious correlation that we found, we found a lot of them. We analyzed 1,000 pairs, like just looking through them. And basically, most of them were just like, you know, co occurring objects, objects that are often co occur with each other, like, for example, like a cup and a, 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 a teapot, like they often visually like presented on the same image. Therefore, networks think that these classes are visually similar. But for some reason, for example, DanceNet thinks that the rocking chair and the diaper looks very similar. And when you look, in detail why it's happening it's before it's again the spurious correlation through the latent variable of a small child so usually on the images with the diapers there is a small child present and 
surprisingly on the images of a rocking chair there are a lot of children there on the rocking chair and therefore the network learns the spurious correlation between these two classes that results in the you can see on the most right uh, figure when you just put a, a chair through the network it says to be a, a dining table something or a folding chair but if you put a child on top of a chair then it's definitely a rocking chair so this demonstrates the ability again how it was found it is by analyzing the distances between neurons we analyze the functional distances between output neurons compare it with the semantic distances that come from some uh, ex expert uh, uh, or from some source where literally humans put some scores between how uh, how the distances are made basically in this case again this is done through the word net and the most when the both metrics disagree the most we report them and we can find very interesting uh, spurious correlations in, in this case exactly through the latent variables like a, a human a fisherman or like a small child uh, and in the last last things that I want to mention, which I found very interesting, is that um, uh, by analyzing by analyzing the correlation between output neurons of eighty different ImageNet trained models, we could see a very interesting relation that the more the less correlated so the less dependent on each other the less the more orthogonal the output representations of the networks are the better they are performing on ImageNet so here on this graph what you can see is actually on the x axis you have the top five accuracy on ImageNet and on the y axis is the more or less Frobenius norm of the distance metrics between output neurons so uh, just to visualize this on the bottom row, you can see four different distance matrices between output neurons. ImageNet has a 1000 concepts as I just uh, discussed. And we can see here on the first left image, this is a distance matrix on, in the AlexNet network, one of the first more or less uh, deep neural networks. And we can see how, uh, like how, um, how, how you can see how the correlated uh, each individual output classes are to each other. And then uh, these four networks, DenseNet, EfficientNet, and VIT, they are um, uh, put into the order of increasing uh, uh, accuracy. And we can see that, for example, like they are fading more or less, meaning that the output neurons become more and more uh, disentangled from each other. And this is quite interesting result. We, we can observe that uh, the, the, oh, sorry, with the better performing models, uh, they are more disentangled in the output space, meaning that they have less correlations and uh, uh, less spurious correlations as well um, so that's kind of interesting insight from from our F, uh, fsca paper and yeah so i want to conclude uh, again i we i presented you two papers one of them is a big one the door where we introduce the novel extreme activation distance this is a very uh, interesting distance measure between uh, 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 between uh, functions. It's allow not only it's not only uh, like have a good uh, performance on various benchmarks compared to some uh, basic uh, distance measures, include the Pearson correlation. But it's also uh, it's it's also interpretable because it is based on the set of anchor points for each individual representation, as they demonstrated this blue and orange points, and you can actually look at them and figure out why exactly your network thinks that these two representations are, are similar to each other why they why these two neurons why they are activating on each other most activating uh, signals you can you can figure out uh, visually by, by looking what's the similarity between this um and uh, yes yeah, so though this this distance measure as we showed in the door allows you to find outlier representations so representations that are detecting concepts that are definitely like something something um, um unique and what we showed there practically this means that often in image net networks this unique concept uh, are something malicious so for example uh, they correspond to chinese watermarks and 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 as well uh, latin watermarks uh, and as demonstrated in the second paper, the function semantic contrast analysis paper, that's by analyzing the contrast between how humans see the con like how humans see the distances between concepts in in a uh, in a supervised scenario when we know the labels of the neurons and how the model 
uh, things that output neurons, like how the output neurons are correlated. By analyzing the dis differences, the contrast between these two distance measures, uh, people can effectively find a lot of spurious correlations as we demonstrated. Uh, this paper, so the Dora paper is online, we published it uh, in uh, June as the function semantic contrast analysis. We, uh, it was accepted to XI conference and it should be published uh, actually this week uh, already online uh, in a Springer. So yeah, um, I hope that's uh, kind of all from my side. Um, please, if you want, you can check out our Dora paper now. If you are interested in uh, explainable AI or have some questions or some ideas, you can always reach uh, uh, to me. Um, uh, yes, and if you had any questions regarding uh, the presentation, uh, please feel free to uh, to uh, yeah to ask them now. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was very um, interesting, very nice presentation. If uh, anyone has any questions, they can ask them now. Uh, hi, uh, can you hear me? Uh, I was just wondering how um, these images that were um, a collection of all of the images that were for a specific class, how they were made. Um, for example, the one with money. Whoop, whoop, whoop. One second. Yes, I will address that. Oops, not. Uh, yes, so um, you mean uh, this uh, type of images, right? Um, if so, you just, if you, I think screen. you unshared, you can uh, re screen share if you want. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, one second. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh da, 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 da. yes here it uh here it is i think uh can you see my screen now it loads but probably it's <laughs> loading but it's probably going to so it's taking a few seconds Yes, no. Ah, okay, yes. Yes, so the thing is that, uh, practically speaking, again, this is like in 2009, uh, it was a Yosho Benjo paper. They introduced the first basic idea of how to do that. It's basically you initialize the input uh, as a parameter. So like every pixel has a free parameter. They are trainable. And you put it through the network. You collect the activation of the specific neuron. And then you do the backpropagation, but not through the weights. So the weights are not included, but you do the backpropagation of gradients to the input. And then you optimize the pixel values to maximize the activation of a neuron. So basically you can think of the pixel values as a parameter that you train and you do it with a gradient descent. So like a, an, an adversarial attack on neuron. So this was a first paper. Um, it was uh, working not that good because nothing could be actually really visible. It's like, you know, this basic example of adversarial attack, like like, like this noise uh, thing. And then people come up with a different regularization. So for example, some people were using GANs to create more realistically looking images. But the, the beauty of the feature visualization method is that there is no other models involved. This is just reparameterization of the image. So what people figured out is that if you parameterize image, not in a pixel domain, but in a frequency domain, if you do the uh, Fourier transformation, like an uh, inverse Fourier transformation, you have a frequencies. And if you optimize frequencies and then you transform them into pixels, it creates more natural looking images. And um, there is a lot of, let's say, uh, uh, there are a lot of small hacks to do how to make them visually uh, pleasant, but generally that's it. A lot of, like also one of the tricks is to perform a transformation. So like rotate this image uh, several times, like perform some operation of a, like usually augmentation. But basically the core idea is just to take some image, parameterize it, and then use the gradients for each parameter of the image to maximize activation of specific neuron. Okay, thank you. Uh, what was the name of that paper again? Um, uh, it's called Feature Visualization. 
uh, I think it's it was on a distill like uh, like yeah like this this is a paper. Uh, very very interesting paper. Um, currently, like I saw, there were um, uh, papers that are trying to, for example, we are also doing some research in in, in terms of how to fool uh, this matters, how to demonstrate that something uh, is doing something that is actually not doing. Um, but yeah, quite a popular way. But uh, there is, for example, a paper that's stating that using natural images is uh, more useful and people understand the function of a neuron much better when they use uh, natural images. Thank you. Thanks for the answer. Um, there is another question in chat uh, by Sandesh. Uh, could you elaborate how can the explanation work with synthetic images? How does the explanation work with the synthetic images? So basically, um, uh, all the figures that I demonstrated here, when we compute the angle between so-called representation activation vectors, we are computing uh, the angle between the centroids of this cluster of how two representation are activated by each other most activating images. But the thing is that you just substitute natural images with the synthetically generated ones, and you understand, like you uh, uh, evaluate the extreme activation distance based on how similar um uh, how similar the activations are on each other synthetically uh, activated images so like basically what it means is that like if you have this uh, two neurons one this neuron and this neuron you create several like this is a parameter of a method we also evaluate how it is important but generally like top top five like just five synthetic signals is enough more or less you generate five synthetic signals for this neuron five synthetic signals for this neuron you put them both through the network and you collect activation of these two neurons on both each other images. So in this case, since they are located together, it means that this money image, if you put it through the network, it really activates the neuron 1376. And if you put this through the network, it really activates the neuron 1731. Of course, it should be mentioned definitely that if you put just money image that is synthetically maximizing this neuron, of course, it would be maximized. So like it maximizes, of course, itself. Uh, that's, I hope, uh, that's kind of the procedure. So so basically that's what, what how it works with the synthetic images. The whole, the same idea, just substituting this real images by synthetically generated ones. Thanks. Thanks a lot. The question was, I think probably, mm -hmm. am I audible? Uh, the question was more about um, related to concepts, right? You had shown money and all those on the synthetic images. And mm -hmm. this was, I, I'm assuming now it is probably for our explanation at this moment and nothing to do with the uh, explanation in the extreme activation thing. That, that was my question. Because ah, I think those synthetic those... images had money and graphs, probably. Uh, that is how I interpreted it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 practically yeah. speaking, to be clear, so when, like, the synthetic are uh, allowing you to not to have the data, which is great, for example, for this clip yes. model, since uh, we don't know the data that it was trained on. But the problem is that they are less uh, interpretable. Uh, that's yes. uh, that's uh, kind of like uh, trade-off. So... Okay. Kind of what we propose in our paper is that if you have an access to the data sets, you definitely know that the model was trained on. So, for example, ImageNet, it's better to 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 use ImageNet natural images. But once you have a, for example, some foundation model that was trained on a billion images that you don't have an access to, then in order to completely understand what concepts have been learned, you can use uh, synthetic because you don't need the data for that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I would also have a question. Um, so, for example, when you you showed in the end the performance graph of um, these models when they perform better yeah, correctly, this one mm -hmm. um, is it fair to say that you can only start like explaining um, or starting to interpret these methods when you reach a base level of performance for any model? Because, for example, if the models are trained badly and they overfit on some data, maybe we know on which or we don't know on which because uh, the training methods differ. Um, like these neurons will always be more active than any other neurons. So is the training quality of a model like a given to even start analyzing mm -hmm. this? 
it's it's a very good question um so like first the uh there is an open uh, like like this is a very big um, uh, 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 question some uh, hints what we have from the research are the following so when we talk about image net net image net models for example we there is a lot of research about that the actually the opposite happens so the transformer models the better performing ones are less interpretable so they are uh, uh their decision making is not like a, like convolutional neural networks like AlexNet. it's basic convolution so when you have a dog on the image it's decided like you it's like you know the heat map of with the local explanation method it's exactly the dog everything as would you expect but if you use a transformer model then the transformer model first of all it patches the images and second of all, it kind of decides on, on some specific parts of a dog. So it's less, this is exactly what I mentioned by the more inductive biases. Um, so less inductive biases that the models become less intuitive. They, they do some stuff, but we kind of don't understand how. So uh, um, your question was mostly about, is it they should reach some basic level of performance? Well, to answer that, I think, first of all, they need to be trained. So like you can try to explain random models, but this is like, un mm -hmm. like you can't do, like it's possible, but you will not get anything because they're just random. Um, but other thing happens. So more the, the, for example, going from convolutional models to the, uh, to the transform models, it, it, there were some papers, um, I think last year on Europe's that demonstrated that, uh, they are less intuitive. And actually, these graphs actually demonstrate this because, like an Alex net and dense net and efficient net, they are more convolutional, they are convolutional based networks. And you can see how these classes they are correlating with each other because it's it's natural to correlate, like, like, like actually, what this uh, figure here, like this big blob is natural uh, classes, so like living organisms, and this big square is all un, like non living things. And, and here each block is like here, I think this big square is dogs. If you can see my, 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 my mouse yep. and, and other stuff is like, like just literally looking animals and, and it's kind of natural and, and quite interpretable why the neurons are correlated with each other. Because like, again, Siberian Husky looks like a Malamute and that's normal, but in VIT, this correlation almost do not exist. Um, Decision-making strategies are quite convoluted not very interpretable uh, so yeah yeah but it is better performing uh, which is interesting so like yeah. like sorry maybe for a long answer but uh, sure. random networks are like not interpretable but uh there isn't like often uh, actually opposite relations it's better like it's easier to explain some worse performing models and, and top uh, models okay but it would go more into the direction of uh convolutional models are still better interpretable than other ones neglecting the performance difference between like major vision transformer or something like that yeah definitely like uh it's this is this is why i mostly work in a post hoc explanation so i uh, like this method that i described are applied after training but often mm -hmm. the big uh, amount of research coming to actually building models that are interpretable by design so this includes various classes of models but uh, all of it comes with a price. So again, this uh, uh, the beta lesson, this is say by Richard Sutton, uh, every time you start forcing your model to behave like you want as a human, like I want this, so like it would work like this, it hurts the performance. And sometimes it is like bad, uh, but sometimes it's actually necessary. For, for safety medical applications, it's much better to be less uh accurate but like that you will have a trust in your decision yeah. um so and again when i'm talking about the um this uh inductive biases thing is just only applied to areas where the data is is a lot but where you can train self supervisedly uh there was a very interesting paper because in medicine you don't have that much data you can't train unsupervisedly mm -hmm. and they're actually forcing network to have a specific strategy actually increases accuracy so just this is for the yeah. context so it doesn't happen in all of the fields it only happens in the fields where you can build uh, like you can train infinitely large data set yeah so. okay 
But do you have some intuition about, for example, how the attention heads behave in some models? Like when you uh, look at certain neurons now, can we draw like some conclusions about the neurons inside attention heads um, from vision transformer? Are there any beneficial patterns or something like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is that uh, uh, still, uh, like, for example, VIT, it has a head and only the token is used for the classification, right? And the thing is that so more or less you can see the VIT as a as an image encoder that takes every image it encodes in, I think, 768 uh, a vector of a size of a 768 values. And still, each of these neurons, it has a semantic meaning. Uh, it is like every other uh, encoder, um, more like like more or less in, in in idea. And then you can explain what each individual number actually means. It is um, by my other research, let's say less interpretable. So what I mean by that is that if I take, for example, some convolutional based network like a ResNet. I take a neuron and then it's like basically, okay, this is a dog neuron. Like I can see that most activating images are dogs and et cetera. Very easy to figure out. I take the same neuron in 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 um, uh, transformer models. Then I look like on, on, on some percentiles of images that are maximally activate this neuron. And I can't as a human uh, comprehend the pattern, what, what's actually similar between these images. Um, there are some methods uh, to decode that, so there is still some patterns of like what what particular features are included in that. But again, so like still the whole methods that I'm describing still apply to transfer models. You can still figure out uh, the circuits, how the decision, how the information flows, what actually each individual neurons are doing, but it's a little bit more complex um, than, than in convolutional models, that's for sure. Um, and especially it becomes more complex if, uh, again, like this is a model that was trained, the VAT that was trained only on ImageNet, but if, uh, for example, in a PyTorch, you can, uh, in a PyTorch.hub, you can actually access the VAT models that were trained, that were pre-trained on on um, other data sets. And, and mm -hmm. um, this becomes harder to explain them since like you can't now, you can't not explain them with an ImageNet uh, data set. You need to synthetically like use the Dora for that, like, and et cetera and such. So, so there is an active research on that. Um, yep. Yeah, yeah. And the, um, I think what, like Mayuk Depp, um, the quarter of uh, the Dora paper, uh, he has now on the image, oh, sorry, on Europe's uh, this year, the paper regarding the better local explanation methods using the um, attention mechanisms, the, uh, like, like memory efficient attention mechanism, I think. Oh, very interesting, uh, yeah, thanks. Kirill, I have a follow-up question on uh, what Ingo just asked. Is the uh, means the dissing entanglement in the uh, neurons? I, I think it's at the output layer, right? That these yeah. charts are showing. Does it mean that probably the correlations in the intermediate or hidden layers are there, which are more I means concepts like uh, if you are a dog and a cat probably they have more correlation if you're looking at an ear of a dog and a cat and some hidden layer neurons are more correlated at that means intermediate concepts rather than the final output that we are trying to correlate it with does that mean those things or means i i missed the point I mean, as a thing that in in this work that in that uh, in the function semantic consciousness, we just analyze the output. But just in intermediate stuff that I did experiments, I can say that yes, uh, actually, the intermediate layer of a VIT is definitely less uh, correlated than in other networks. Um, meaning that basically what it means is that they have more efficient representations that are disentangled and they uh, encode the uncorrelated. Uh, concepts. However, that's that's the, the whole. So, like the convolutional neural networks, since they don't have any attention heads, they basically have a convolutional field test, and it's kind of expected from the uh, from the neurons that detect some kind of cat features to be correlated with some other, like because like yeah. like high level features they share some, I don't know, fur, like some some sub things. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the attention mechanism actually allows you to learn much more intricate strategies in a specific area. So, 
So um, yeah, practically, in, in what I practiced, what I saw is that BIT that this is an output, but if you open the last convolution, like not convolution, but last layer, uh, the uh, the final attention head, the tokens that I used, uh, they are more decorrelated than um, layers in other networks. Okay. Um, so basically, kind of transformers are harder to explain. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it means, um, but they are better performing. So um, the progress, as I mentioned, the progress in deep learning does not help. Like like the, the methods are becoming better and better, but they are less and less interpretable. So we need to uh, kind of like, like speed up <laughs> the explainability research. Um, yeah. So what are the areas in which uh, this uh, research is taking up? And so what, what, what are the... Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one area, right, in which explainability has been tried out. What are the other parameters you mentioned? Obviously, one you already mentioned that during training itself, it's, yeah, we are, we are trying to do yes. that more explanation, more explainable by design. Uh, what yes. other yeah. areas are there, active research? So the thing is that, like, um, explainable AI is in itself, um, like what I mentioned, there are, like, post hoc explanation methods that are using already trained models. Um, this is, I think, the biggest area. Um, the other areas include uh, um, ex explainable machines by design. So, for example, one um, uh, line of work that I know is the prototypical networks. And what they do is actually they, uh, you have, by training, you have a set of features that you first want to extract from the uh, data, like, 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 a, in visual sense, these are exactly the features that you want your classifier to use. And then the final decision is made by how close, um, like, um, like how close the data point is, like I might be wrong there, but as far as I know, like how close the data point is to one of these classes. So you have a prototypical, like, like it's some kind of, like here I'm not a very big specialist, so I might say something wrong, but as far as I know, I, I see it as a more or less kind of like, um, that the decision is made, you can see how like by prototypical examples that are most closest one. So like you, you have a model, you train it, and then you have this uh, prototypes, and then the final decision making could be visualized as uh, by uh, demonstrating what is the closest prototype to the image you just inference. So like if you have a bird, you put it into the network, and then you can visualize that it is close to some bird in the data set. And like, this is an explanation more or less. Okay. Um, so uh, this is only one way how to make self-interpretable networks. Um, basically just uh, in area of, um, this came mostly as far as I know from the area of neurosymbolic learning. There are basically like networks that are uh, performing if or operations. So like, uh, you can combine the feature extractors and then like if or operations, so that would be more interpretable. But again, uh, I'm mostly working in a post hoc explanations there with, an, um, with uh, exactly with the progress in NLP. Um, so like I call it the global explanations, uh, uh, but genuinely some people uh, call like like the same thing with the, within the large language models often refer to them as a mechanistic interpretability. Again, um, trying to uh, figure out what each individual neurons are doing, how they are, um, uh, how they are combined in a circuit. There is a very nice uh, circuit thread uh, from uh, Antropic, uh, if you know. Um, very interesting research, and uh, yeah, uh, genuinely explaining large language models is a big uh, issue, and uh, people are doing that as well using like there was a paper from open ai they used uh, uh gpt to explain the gpt neurons so yeah thanks um so before finishing off i would actually like to ask you the question we always ask at the end um if you read any interesting papers paper or papers um Lately, it doesn't have to be connected to what we talked about today, just a personal recommendation, something interesting you saw. Uh, um, like, um, <laughs> I don't remember the name, but I read it actually today. So like, um, 
I uh, I hope no one will like. Um, uh, this is just the last papers that I, uh, I remember, but I don't remember the name of it. So like, I think it's a, it's. A, but uh, I so it's not even okay. It's not even a paper. But um, what I remember is there is now a competition on the conference called uh, SAT ML, which is the first, like the second uh, conference in transform machine learning, and the uh, and the, the the competition is is very interesting. Uh, there were uh, installed twelve backdoor attacks in the output. As far like as far as I know, it's an output layer of um, one model. There were there, there are twelve uh, 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 trojans they call it, but it's a backdoor attack. So it's basically if you put something on an image, it will trigger the decision making to a specific class. So I uh, I might be wrong, uh, but I think eight of them are known. And four of them are unknown. And the competition is to find actually, like to build a method to find this unknown uh, backdoor attacks. And, and this is very interesting because it's very related to what the explainability is doing. And this is some sort of auditing. So like one of the biggest uh, application of the whole explainability is to audit the models, to figure out, okay, what are the concepts that the, the model uh, learned and are there any bad ones and can we actually uh, like drop them maybe not use this concept that are uh, not cool and 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 this competition they they first give you money as far as i know if you if you solve it and the second of course you get a get um like uh, uh, featured in the paper i personally find this very interesting uh, competition uh, applicable to use and maybe to come up with the new methods to find uh, the the this this import like put put trojans within the models so yeah i mean uh, it's not a paper but actually they uh, within this with this competition they also release a new rips paper i don't remember the name i saw it today uh it's about how you can use the global explanation uh, global explanation methods to is it possible to find this uh, backdoor attacks with them very interesting paper. Unfortunately, I don't remember the name, but I remember the competition. So I hope uh, maybe uh, someone, if someone is interested, that's a very interesting. We competition. we're semi promising we're going to find it and link it in the YouTube video and in the posts. So yeah, I like catching people off guard with this question because we actually get pretty interesting uh, answers like this one. So thanks for that. I can send um, you the link afterwards. I will. I because I remember I sent uh, uh, the link to to to. Uh, to some of my co-workers so I can easily find it. Um, I and think actually, I, I think Sandesh find link. it. Yeah. I think this is, uh, this is the link. So we're going to link it in the YouTube video for the people that are watching the recording and they can check it out themselves. Uh, okay, cool. Um, I wanna thank everybody that asked the questions uh, today. For an interesting discussion. I want to especially thank Kirill for taking the time to talk to us and present his paper. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking time and um, see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye.